Violent conflict seems irrational if there are non-violent ways to get what you want. Almost everyone wants to live and not die a violent death. So you would expect people or groups uh, with disagreements, uh, they would spend a lot of time and effort to settle their differences peacefully. Nevertheless, violence is obviously still an important tool for states, non-state groups, uh, and individuals. This represents, I would argue, the fundamental puzzle at the heart of peace science and conflict studies. If most people want to live peacefully, why do various types of actors use violence instead of nonviolence to get what they want? Relatedly, another puzzle at the heart of a large swath of the recent conflict literature is that poverty is still relatively common around the world, yet conflict is relatively scarce. If economic scarcity causes conflict, why are some poor countries peaceful and others violent? This second puzzle is at the heart of this part of today's discussion. Most traditional scholars of conflict from back to uh, E.H. Carr uh, in the interwar period all the way up to scholars uh, at the end of the Cold uh, War uh, were focused on understanding the causes of interstate conflict. Uh, the motivation for focusing on this kind of conflict was understandable um, because everyone wanted to try to understand and survive the tectonic shifts that were um, uh, underway in international relations uh, in Europe and Asia during the time, as well as being able to survive after World War II, um, a, a world in which you had multiple antagonistic nuclear weapons powered states. Um, after the end of the Cold War, however, uh, the risk of major power war uh, declined dramatically. There wasn't a USSR around um, for the West uh, to be worried about fighting uh, anymore. Um, and uh, civil wars, by and large, uh, took their place as the most frequent um, and worrying form of uh, conflict. These uh, conflicts often happened uh, in poorer states that had been allied with either one of the major powers um, during the Cold War. And during that period, they had become uh, dependent on either the West or the USSR uh, for uh, a lot of yeah, economic, political, and uh, military support. Once the support had dried up after the end of the Cold War in 1990, um, there was a strong push to democratize, uh, to have more representative institutions, and to include uh, in a more representative government uh, groups that had been previously excluded. Um, these efforts uh, and the pushback against them uh, is often traced to the growth in civil conflict um, in the 1990s, as we saw uh, with the graphs of conflict last week. Um, like most um, political scientists, conflict scholars want to try to understand the most pressing challenges the world faces uh, in their time. And um, they uh, shifted focus uh, after the end of the Cold War from uh, interstate conflict to civil conflict. Um, it is not to say that uh, political scientists are, in are not interested in following fads. They're not immune uh, to such things. I think the most common example uh, of this, the most dramatic example of this in my experience was the growth in terrorism researchers after 9-11 as um, both governments, individuals, um, as well as academics tried to figure out um, what is motivating these kind of terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda and what policies would be most effective in, in constraining them. So um, you see here with this Google Ngram viewer, you see in this trend uh, a dramatic growth in both the study of interstate conflict as uh, just more books were were uh, published during the time period, but even more dramatic growth in the research in civil conflict, as you can see from this end, um, Google Ngram. So today, um, uh, we really are going to try to reinforce uh, the lessons from last week's uh, readings and discussions uh, about some of the main um, uh, findings in the conflict research and the, limita the current limitations in them um, before moving on to see how uh, economic factors, money specifically, um, uh, affects decisions to use violence, both at the group level and at the individual level. So as you can see in this, in this uh, map of, of violence in 2019, civil conflict and, and political violence um, are still clear and frequent dangers in a lot of different countries around the world. 
So last week, the, um, the reading was a literature review by um, Blattman and Miguel. Um, yeah, I think it was a compelling uh, place to start for a couple of different reasons. First, I, I think it's a readable uh, literature review that clearly uh, sets out both the strengths and the weaknesses uh, of the current literature in an approachable way. Um, and it frames uh, the literature using uh, some of the major causal contributions from the uh, interstate conflict literature because there's a, a lot of um, academics, including Blattman and Miguel, I, that would argue that a lot of their strategic considerations behind decisions to use force internationally uh, might also apply uh, domestically as well with a, a, a couple of important differences. Um, third, the 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 literature review touched on a lot of themes we're going to be coming back to uh, over the course of the semester. So it's good to kind of um, paint that map in the beginning and then uh, uh, elaborate on it and, and bring in more details in certain areas as, uh, as they're relevant. So let's reiterate a couple of the main points of the uh, Blattman and Miguel um, piece. Um, I think their, one of their main criticisms uh, was um, the lack of focus in the literature on the central theoretical problems underlying uh, civil conflict. They highlight the risk of endogeneity um, that uh, we've uh, touched on before, that um, if you uh, argue, for example, that A causes B, um, endogeneity and the endogeneity risk is that B actually has an effect on A, uh, and it could be the entire effect, so that you really think the relationship is A to B, but it's really B um, uh, leads uh, to, to A. Um, they argue that war can be considered uh, and civil conflict can be considered as a contest between two identifi uh, identifiable groups. Um, and um, these groups have different amounts of information about both their own capabilities as well as the capabilities of the other uh, contestant. Um, so these kind of informational asymmetries, one has some information the other one uh, doesn't, could make... Um, reaching a peace agreement hard, either before conflict or after conflict. Um, it could also uh, lead to commitment problems because both sides would have incentives to try to shirk or renege on agreements, either without the other side knowing or with the other side knowing if they believe they're not in a position uh, to object. Um, uh, I think these two issues, um, and they talk a bit about it in the in the readings, are the most directly related to the uh, interstate conflict literature because both of these issues, I think, were most influentially introduced to this international conflict literature by James Fearon in his 1995 article in International Organization that some of you might have read before in which there um, are... Uh, Fearon explains why, given incentives to not go to conflict, they can still happen. Information and commitment problems are two uh, issues that he highlights. Why would groups or individuals um, participate in such a risky endeavor as fighting either for the country uh, or against it? Um, Blattman and Miguel highlight selective incentives or co uh, coercion. Selective incentives, uh, people who are trying to organize um, a conflict or uh, the government um, to get their military to do what they want, um, provides incentives for people to participate that people who don't participate wouldn't be able to get access to. Uh, and coercion, pretty obvious that if we, if you don't help us, then we're going to hurt you or we're going to hurt things that you care or people that you care about. So they're uh, coerced to, to participating. There's a whole literature on, on this about how rebel groups um, can coerce either with resources um, or with, uh, with, with force. Uh, one of the mainstreams of the literature dating back um, in the civil conflict literature uh, to the 1970s would be the focus on uh, ethnicity, uh, ethnic groups, and their reasons um, for conflict. Um, ethnic groups are seen as having a built-in organization and cohesiveness, um, a, as well as uh, an ability to be targeted by people who might not like them because people don't get to opt in to an ethnic group. It's part of an identity uh, or observable uh, things about people that they can't hide that could lead to 
both um, clear incentives for being part of the uh, group or clear uh, dis disincentives or drawbacks for being um, excluded from, from certain goods given to their uh, ethnic, uh, given their ethnic status. A couple of other factors that uh, Blatt and Miguel, um talk about when they're summarizing the literature as of 2010 um, are ones we're going to be coming back to again and again in this class. Weak political institutions. Uh, a lot of the states that had conflicts from um, uh, the end of the Cold War up until about 2010 often uh, were in relatively weak states, ones that had new institutions or ones that had been defined by colonial powers or major powers to suit ends that weren't necessarily for the benefit of the most people uh, within these countries. Um, and countries that started having elections after 1990 that had some of the trappings of democracy, maybe uh, holding elections, but not other crucial election systems for protection of uh, minorities or effective governance um, towards uh, benefiting both majority and uh, minority groups. The, some of the, I think the most close to my interests in the conflict literature are the um, international factors affecting civil conflict. Blatt and McGill talk about uh, both refugee flows that are generated by civil conflicts as well as from other areas that can end up sparking uh, conflict. A recent example of that would be um, the people moving from Rwanda into the Democratic Republic of Congo um, and those areas of uh, refugee uh, camps ended up uh, enabling um, the inter Ahamwe from Rwanda to regroup and be able to start um, fighting um, within the DRC and um, interventions by major powers. Uh, I worked on a data project back in graduate school um, collecting data on diplomatic interventions when um, high-level diplomatic efforts to try to stop the conflict um, as well as military and economic interventions favoring one side or the other. So there's a lot of international factors that can shape the likelihood of uh, conflict outset, uh, onset. They also highlight the clear research limitations in um, the works that existed then, and a lot of the ones that they flag are still relevant today. Um, uh, and they're not immune to uh, criticism as well. The, a couple of weaknesses that I found uh, in their argument um, is... It, they can highlight questions that all of us are aware of and grapple with, but there might not be perfect solutions. One would be trying to find good proxies for informational asymmetries or commitment problems that you can have a clear idea that it might be theoretically important, but actually looking at it in a broad-based manner, could, it could be difficult to try to find measures of information or the difficulties in committing to any agreement. Um, uh, Eric Gartsky, in a piece on international conflict, I think is relevant to, uh, uh, in his critique of the international conflict literature, is relevant to the civil conflict literature uh, as well. In it was a, it was a, I read this in grad school, and it was really disconcerting because he kind of bursts the bubble of this larger context and goals that academics are working towards in trying to understand generalizable trends in, in conflict. And uh, Eric's main point was that some the what really matters is the things that you can't ex ante understand or measure. That idiosyncratic causes um, for particular conflicts makes detecting patterns um, uh, impossible, that it could just be an interaction of people and institutions, it could be a unique um, uh, political situation within a country that is not really generalizable, that these idiosyncratic causes um, for conflict are crucial, and the implication from that would be that you shouldn't be looking across conflicts for understanding patterns, but you should look in depth to um, particular cases to try to understand um, what are the driving forces behind them. Um, uh, one more um, uh, critique, I think, um, and, and the, the limitations of it is that leaders can just make mistakes. They can overestimate their own capacity or dedication, uh, their likelihood of winning, uh, or they could have a short shadow of the future. Um, 
Wintrobe has an influential book, um, and uh, Robert Powell and others that have looked at how leaders shadow the future matters for how well they govern and how well they respond uh, to challenges. So if a leader thinks they're going to be in power for 20 or 30 years, they might res respond um, more or less strongly than if they were thinking they're not going to be in power for very long. So when we think about people's decisions, are they making decisions in the moment uh, for immediate considerations and should we look at those? Or are they looking at their uh, own success down, down the road or their children's uh, success? How long is their shadow future in trying to make decisions? One other interesting point um, that they do make is that economic motivations for conflict are better theorized than psychological or sociological factors. I think this is relevant to the topic of today, and a lot of the literature on conflict comes from economists like Paul Collier and a focus on rational choice, uh, decision-making models, um, looking at economic costs and benefits of participation. Um, and so that's why we're, I wanted to start looking at economic motivations before trying to realize where the limitations of that approach might arise and what other causes we might want to focus on. So for today, um, I'm really less focused on the environmental factors that we're going to be covering later on in the semester. We're focusing on human securities, relationship to conflict, and um, both general human security later on, but we're going to start with economic aspects of human security um, because I think all of us recognize the importance of being able to put a roof over our heads and be able to have a regular source of income and food um, that is a prerequisite for us um, searching for a, a lot of other uh, goals that we, we might want to pursue. Um, so Blackman and Miguel suggest that economic um, sources of conflict were um, uh, most developed, and I would say even a, a decade later that that still holds. Um, and this economic cause uh, literature is often defined by a debate that started uh, 20 years ago between whether the main ex uh, explanatory factors for conflict are um, uh, fueled more by um, greed uh, or by grievances uh, against the state. So let's wade into this uh, greed and grievance debate. It is a simplistic uh, heuristic in trying to pit um, these two explanatory factors against each other. I think most academics would recognize that both are relevant, but as with a lot of things in this class, it's about relative importance of explanatory factors and what you want to focus your primary attention on, recognizing other things are outside the scope of what you're actually looking at. Um, so the, the basic idea behind the greed uh, argument for um, conflict is that economic factors are the most important for motivating actors. Uh, and this could be to seize lootable natural resources. If your country has oil, um, uh, other mining um, resources, that by taking control of that territory within the state, or if the government controls it and gets tax revenue from it, controlling the government allows you to control those resources um, and how they're distributed within the state. Um, so you can control the area of relative wealth. There was a rebel group in Angola that tried to control the Kabinda, uh, Kabinda part of Angola because that's where the resources uh, were in and that's where they, are, they thought that they should have an increased share of the distribution of the benefits. Um, right now in Mozambique, you have a group in the area in which there's a huge oil and, and natural gas uh, effort underway to try to gain control of part of that area of northern Mozambique. So it's an ongoing issue of trying to um, control areas that have economic benefit. Er, uh, economic benefit. Um, also, just from a, from a practical standpoint, once conflict has started, uh, David Keene, um, Reno, and others have argued that there could be wartime economies spring up, that greed could be a motivating factor, not necessarily for getting the benefits after war ends, but controlling the resources why the, while the conflict is ongoing. Most conflicts um, last a lot longer than uh, 
interstate conflicts, the average civil conflict is last seven years, while the average interstate conflict lasts well less than one year. Um, and so there can be a war economy springing up to benefit from the lack of central government control over a particular territory, or for people on the governmental side to control the expenditure of resources to fight the uh, opposing group, or for political control that we need to stay in power in order to fight um, uh, those people who are trying to take over part of our country. Now, um, contrasting uh, greed, and I think Paul Collier and others were saying that the previous literature from the 60s, 70s, and 80s didn't adequately focus on those economic motivators for conflict. They were more focused on the grievances, why people uh, want to be able to fight to control the government. And um, different groups within the, the, uh, the state have um, grievances because of the policies or the history uh, of the the governing uh, actors within within their state, um, simple uh, dynamic. We're going to be getting back to this uh, in more detail as we focus on specific elements, but it's a way to kind of think about: um, is it purely for self interest in in economic cost benefit analysis, which we're going to look at in a second, or is it long standing grievances um, against the government or a particular leader that is motivating people to uh, to fight? So let's um, let's delve into the Paul Collier and Anka uh, Hoffler 1998 piece um, for this week. I think this is one of the earliest and most influential um, descriptions of the greed approach to trying to understand conflict um, and economic models of uh, conflict just in general um, by two Oxford academics who did uh, a lot of further on work uh, after this developing this argument. This is the, one of the earliest uh, statements of it, so I thought it would be the, um, a, a good one for us to, to start with. Um, the main point is that um, um, there are often rational choice models of civil conflict um, to uh, um, behind it. Uh, civil wars have economic causes. Wars break out with um, uh, benefits exceed the costs, and grievances are universal, but um, greed, uh, but wars are not. So, if, uh, all countries have some group within it that are dissatisfied. That's the nature of governance, right? That you have um, to make decisions at the national level that have distributional effects within um, the country. Um, that their argument is that it must be something else. The grievance is just part of the story. It might interact with other greed factors that can motivate grievances in order to reach an underlying but unstated economic gain. 